again. Thank I, you. You know, as bishop, I'm I'm usually asked to be muted, and so <laughs> <laughs> um, it's a it's an honor to be here uh, and a pleasure uh, for this gathering from St. John's Ellicott City. And I just want to applaud you right off the bat for having this series. And I, I know about the others on the program and the series. And I just think it's wonderful. It's one of the things that makes St. John's one of the preeminent congregations in our diocese. You're certainly one of the larger ones. But, um, but just the work you do, and, and let me just say, your leadership in this and in other areas, you're a leader in the Diocese of Maryland. You're, you're all lucky to have her. And um, I know she feels she's lucky to also be with you all in, that, in this congregation. So I love St. John's and I love you for doing this. I also just wanna give a brief shout out. I see so many friends and, and people uh, that I should acknowledge, but I do see Tom and Sally Goss. Uh, I want you all to know I use them uh, or maybe they use me for, uh, for pilgrimages around the world. South Africa, I'm sorry, um, the Holy Land, and we'll be back there in April of 2022. Um, but this fall, actually, in October, we plan to have our first pilgrimage. It won't be my first. Uh, I've been there several times. But to South Africa, where we will see what that nation has done, the Republic of South Africa, in the areas of racial reconciliation and justice. We, we have some things to learn from them here in the United States. So... Um, so I'm, I'm taking this opportunity to say, if you're interested in coming to South Africa for a couple of weeks, see the animals, we'll go on safari and also visit a uh, number of places, but, but also focus on uh, the areas of racial justice and reconciliation and the marvelous, incredible strides that that nation has made. So with that, I will have a prayer and then um, Shadrach, Meshach, and away we go. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty and ever-living God, in this evening's conversations, so draw our hearts to you, so guide our minds, so fill our imaginations, so control our wills, that we may be wholly yours, utterly dedicated to you. And then use us, we pray, all of us, especially at St. John's Church in Ellicott City. Use us as you will, and always to your glory and the welfare of your people. Through your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Okay, as... Um, as uh, Mother Ann was saying to you earlier, I've been speaking a lot on racial reconciliation lately, uh, both in this diocese around various churches, but also around the country and other dioceses and institution, educational institutions and others, and um, writing some articles and being interviewed here and there on this issue. Because in May of 2019, the Diocese of Maryland made history. We were one of the very first religious institutions in this country to make a commitment to reparations as a remedy for centuries of racial oppression. And then a year later, it was supposed to be exactly a year later, but the pandemic um, uh, caused us to have to uh, push back our convention. At convention in September of last year, we put up money to it, a dollar figure. We committed one million dollars from diocesan resources collected from centuries, one million dollars to commit to investing in the impoverished Black community. Why did we do that? Well, for the next uh, 25 minutes or so, I'm gonna go into why we've done that. And then some more about practicalities and uh, what we are hoping to do in the future. So I'm gonna be talking uh, about racial reconciliation. As I said, I've been talking a lot about it. And somebody said to me the other day, Bishop Sutton, every one of your talks 
on racial reconciliation is better than the next. So think about that and we'll go further. So um, race, now there's a conversation that almost all of us want to avoid, especially because it's so difficult and it's ridden with many emotions, including sadness, guilt, grief, anxiety, anger, and hopelessness. Now, I'm not gonna try to overload you with more than you can handle in this one pre presentation, but I do promise to give you some things to think about, about where we are as a church and what, where St. John's is and what you can do and by the way, prepare yourself to get angry at me at some time in this talk, okay? Don't worry, it's part of the process. You're supposed to get mad. And by the way, I'm just the messenger. So if you get angry, just know you're on track. Good, here we go. If you ask most, most Americans, are we as a nation better off now in our race relations than we, uh, are we better off now than 50 years ago, say, at the end of the civil rights era? If you ask most Americans, are we doing well? The answer is, sober, is sobering, because on that, we are all agreed. From a Pew Research poll a little over a year ago, it says that a majority of Americans say that race relations in the United States are bad. And of those, about seven in 10 say things are getting even worse. Roughly two thirds say it's become more common for people to express racist or racially insensitive views in the last several years, if not necessarily more acceptable. Significantly, even most white people don't feel good about where we are. And I, I, I think you realize, I hope you know that there's a wide gulf between what most white Americans say we are and most Americans of color, especially African Americans. There is a wide gulf in how we see things. But even most white people don't feel good about where we are. Almost all of us thought that we would be farther along than we are now. Remember Woodstock? Anybody here remember Woodstock in 1969? Yeah, just raise your hand. If it, yeah, yeah, you're old, you're old, you're old. <laughs> And I do. Uh, remember Lovins, Peace and Harmony, Age of Aquarius, when the moon was in its seventh house and Jupiter aligns with Mars, then peace will guide the planets and love will fill the stars. This is the dawning of the age. You could sing it with me. We're not in church, <laughs> but yeah, I know you're muted. Well, I won't go further. Uh, I'm not really getting paid for this, uh, but I, I will open at the 17th Street McDonald's um, in a couple of months if we can reopen. Uh, just kidding. Well, we thought that there really would be, those of us who are uh, children of the, of the 60s and earlier, we thought we'd be further along. I certainly did. Well. Um, uh, again, from the Pew, the Pew Research, quote, opinions about the state of race relations um, and the amount of attention paid to race vary considerably across racial and ethnic groups. Blacks, Hispanics, and Asians are more likely than whites to say that not enough has been done. Large majorities of Asians, Hispanics, and Blacks say people not seeing discrimination where it exists is a bigger problem in the U.S. than people seeing it where it doesn't exist. Now, by some measures, we really are in a better place. We know that. We've taken down all the signs saying whites only, coloreds only. We've integrated all the water fountains and the bathrooms. Although there's still a problem with some swimming pools. Did you know that? Still some swimming pools. Um, uh, and not all clubs are open either to all persons of all 
races. More and more blacks can purchase homes in more and more neighborhoods. In Maryland, it's hard to think of a neighborhood where if a black person purchased a home, uh, it would be prevented. We're on TV and movie screens and precedented numbers and starring roles. We've made tremendous strides in access to education and good jobs. Uh, uh, the former president had a black person in his administration. I have to point that out, one in, in our nation. Um, there are fewer instances <laughs> of she or he is the first black person to, and now you fill in the blank. I remember that joyous day for me and, and Mar or March 29, 2008, when I was elected bishop in the Diocese of Maryland, this diocese where, um, of course, the first bishop of Maryland and almost all of the Anglican clergy uh, clearly, most of them own slaves. That was part of their compensation, was enslaving other people so that they can get money. Well, I was elected on the first ballot in 2008, knowing full well that 40 years earlier, in 1968, I would not have been welcomed as a worshiper in most of our Episcopal churches in this diocese in that 40 year span, that's a lot of progress. And I don't for a moment want to minimize the very substantial gains in racial justice over the last 50 some years. We can all celebrate the tremendous strides that have made, been made in racial attitudes in our nation. We're very proud of the accomplishments of the many black individuals who have overcome great odds to achieve success. I'm one of those. Um, and at another time, I could tell you more of my story, how uh, being raised in, in Washington, DC, um, certainly in an all black community, uh, by the time I was in elementary school, when my parents moved into the neighborhood that we were in in Washington, it was actually, we were one of the first black families. Within four or five years, they all moved away all the white families moved away. And I, I knew at a very young age, I got that message and it continued. And that is we weren't good enough to live near. And um, um, most blacks learned that lesson somewhere. We're somehow a little less than. And I know many of you would think, but you're not less than, but you see too many signs of it. And that gave rise to last year, uh, a number of people just saying, you know, black lives matter. And I know many people say, of course they matter. All lives matter, but no, no, black lives matter. Because in so many instances we see, it seems to matter less than. So we've achieved great success, but for the millions, millions of descendants of slaves who are trapped in a pernicious cycle of hopelessness, poverty, and rage due to their real experience of racial segregation, redlining, inferior schools, substandard housing, and the like. The widespread assumption that everyone can pull themselves up by their own bootstraps is a lie. In fact, my family and I needed help in order to overcome great odds in the DC public schools. It took adults reaching down from other parts of the city to reach down and kind of rescue me and saying, you can make it, you can make it. But on my own, the odds were against, the odds were stacked against. It's one of the reasons why I'm so proud of our diocese having the Sutton Scholars Program, where we basically uh, take over a hundred high school students in the Baltimore City public school system and commit to helping them for four years to get through Halls High School and become the men and women that God created them to be and that they, that they want to be. 
Uh, and thank you for many of you who helped support that, uh, that, that program. Uh, the, di the Diocese of Maryland is known more and more in Baltimore and in the state of Maryland as this one church organization that is not giving up on impoverished Black students in the city of Baltimore. Well, uh, but, so, by, but my Sutton scholars, those students, they're working hard, but I know this, uh, the stacks are against them. None of them are ever going to great schools. None of them. They'll go to some good schools. And, and I'm happy to say that our first class, all of them uh, uh, sought and got accepted into a college, but not the top flight schools that you may be thinking of because the odds are against them in so many fronts and it's not their fault. They cannot change their environment. They can, they cannot change the color of their dark skin. These days, it certainly doesn't feel that we are closer to being a more racially harmonious than when Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was cut down by a rifle of a, of a terrorist, a white supremacist in 1968. And by the way, terrorism is not new in America. We know that. It's been since the beginning of time, and especially if you were of a certain race or color, your experience in this nation was largely one of terror, committed by terrorist acts of persons, many of whom went to church every Sunday. Uh -huh. African-Americans comprise only 13% of the U.S. population, estimated only 14% of, most, of mostly drug users. But why is it that almost 40% of persons arrested for drug-related offenses in America are Black? Studies show that police are more likely, much more likely to pull over and frisk Blacks or Latinos than whites who, uh, for some of the same things. And, and um, the U.S. Sentencing Commission reported that African-Americans received 10% longer sentences than whites through the federal system for committing the same crimes. And again, these are not accidents. This was these, these attitudes and actions are centuries in the making. In 2009, African Americans were 21% more likely than whites to receive mandatory minimum sentences and 20% more likely to be sentenced to prison than white drug defendants. Just five years ago, 51% of Americans expressed anti-Black sentiments in a poll. That was a 3% increase from 2008. There are numerous studies, I could go on, there are lots of figures, but there are numerous studies showing hidden implicit bias in some amount in all of us especially those who say, well, I don't see color or race and I don't have a racist bone in my body. But do some more work on implicit bias. And when I say all of us, I mean all of us, no matter what your color or your race. Another way I like to put it is our nation, as good as it is and as much as I love it and I'm pat and, and, and patriotic and all that, our nation, our nation was born in racism, birthed in it. And it's the air we breathe, and it's the ocean we swim in. A fish does not know it's wet. An American, it's hard to know, for an American to realize that she or he is racist. Even African Americans, uh, you know the studies and this um, in classic ones, even um, uh, African-American girls, more times than not, when presented with a doll, will, will choose the white doll over the black doll because they get the message that black is not better, that somehow the white doll is better. 
I've even read a story a few months ago, a news article uh, polling doctors. It, it showed more, I think this was, I forget exactly where it was in America, but doctors show more racist attitudes toward their patients when they're not rested, when they, when they have long shifts and all that. And so um, to you, my white brothers and sisters who are doctors, I'm very invested in you getting your sleep, get enough sleep. And um, there it is. As a young man in college, I kept hearing, young people today are growing up in a less racist, multiracial, and multi multicultural world, and they get it. So racism will be practically dead in a generation, or maybe two at most. Well, it's been over two generations since King, and here we are, here we are. Are we doomed to live in racial strife, mistrust, and conflict? If we are not doomed, then how do we fix it? How do we fix it? I'm gonna name four things that need to happen. The first three I'm gonna just go through very quickly and spend time on the fourth. First, we need to commit ourselves to having civil kind of conversations, much like you're doing this evening in these series. We need to commit ourselves to it. Civil conversation. No more name calling. You know, I, I, I live here in Baltimore and the names that we are called in my predominantly black and brown city comes right out of the playbook of racial tropes that have been played and replayed in this country for hundreds of years. After our former president, after President Trump made a slur against my city, your city, um, uh, do you remember when he said this rat infested, vermin infested um, place? And we, we, we know what that's about. Now I know he was someone who insulted everybody. He was in some ways an equal opportunity um, uh, insulter. And I'm not saying there weren't good reasons to vote for him. If you're a Republican or others, I know there are lots of things going on, but um, we know the slur. It was the same slur against Jewish populations too. Um, and I wrote him a letter uh, and I, I showed my colleagues that letter in the Ecumenical Leaders Group of Maryland and every single one of them signed on to that letter to our former president, the Roman Catholic Archbishop, Lutheran Bishop, Methodist Bishop, the Presbyterian um, uh, uh, executive presbyter, UCC person, others, uh, they all signed on and said, no more name calling. And we told them about the good things we're doing in Baltimore. And also we know that because of the racism, you'll never hear of a white community called vermin infested or rat infested. That's only for certain communities. And by the way, I've been to the White House, a very clean place, but do you know there are rats in the White House? <laughs> I mean, real animals, I mean, not I mean, animal rats. There are, there are rats in the White House. Uh, there was a famous, um, uh, there was a famous um, incident where Barbara Bush was swimming in the pool and there was a, a rat there. Now, I, I'm just saying, but you will never, I'm gonna get off of that. We need to have civil conversations. Stop the, stop the name calling. And what do you do when you hear it? If you, if, or, or when you're up against it. Second, we need to remind ourselves that social critique of our nation's history and present life is both healthy and patriotic. Critique. If you cannot critique this nation, and its leaders and our institutions that you are not being patriotic. Our, our forefathers um, uh, who handed down these institutions, they would have said that's exactly what we were trying to get to, to go against because they knew the problems of subservience to the state. And they, they were escaping that when they came here. So we need to critique ourselves and know that that's, that's okay, that's patriotic. We need to uh, critique our church. I love the Episcopal church, 
But if I can't critique it, what kind of leader am I? And what kind of member am I? I love myself. I love me and I critique myself. My wife loves me. Well, she never critiques me. Um, I see too much laughter out there. <laughs> Just know that critique. First, again, have civil conversations of truth telling, but they got to be so civil. Two, critique. That is telling the truth and the whole truth not just part of it, not just part of it, tell the whole story. The third thing we need to do is have, we need people of courage who call out the perniciousness of racist language and behaviors whenever they encounter it. It just takes people of courage. It's hard to do that sometimes. Some of the things I've already said this evening, it's hard for me to say but it's the truth. And we're not gonna get far unless we can tell the truth. But then there's the fourth thing we need to do. My sisters and brothers, we need to repay the debt or make attempts to repay the debt now long overdue that this nation has owed for almost 400 years of slavery and racial oppression. Why did I say that? Several reasons. But one, you know, despite our generally negative assessments of the current state of race relations, Americans do tend to say that most racial and ethnic groups get along fairly well with one another one-on-one, -on -one. meaning that individual whites and Asians get along fairly well. Individual Hispanics and Asians, Blacks and Hispanics, whites and Hispanics, Blacks and Asians, even Blacks and Asians. I was just writing about that today. I, I drafted a letter from the Episcopal Bishop for the Episcopal Bishops of African descent calling out the violence against our Asian sisters and brothers. And there've been some tensions in those communities, but that's drowned out a lot of positive things that are happening, especially with Korean and African-Americans. You just, they just don't get the press because only conflict gets press and, and gets highlighted. Well, most people say that they get along fairly well with individuals and groups of particular groups except for one, assessments of how well blacks and whites get along together, especially in groups and communities. Not a majority say it's not so good. I wonder why, why is that the only pairing where most people say there's a lot of work to be done. The answer in large part is because of a little thing that happened for centuries, it's called slavery. For 250 years, 250 years, beginning in 1619, white people enslaved black people. I know not all. Not all whites and not all blacks were enslaved. But then in the, for the next 110 years or so until the end of the civil rights era around 1970, let us say, uh, white people generally made it nearly impossible for black people to get good jobs, get good housing, get good education, get good health care, even by law. And the church, the church blessed it, the church blessed it. This 350 year period of overt, constant and pervasive oppression has left a scar, not just on black persons, but on the souls of white persons. It's left a scar. And when people are scarred, 
they sometimes, well, frequently go overboard in trying to deny what caused the scar and avoid the scar. But there is a scar because it's never really been dealt with. This nation has never, as a nation, apologized. Did you know that? For, for this four, four century old period of monstrous conduct. The federal government has not done that. And it has never made a single attempt to actually repay what was stole, stolen. And I know there are programs for the poor and there was affirmative action and all of that. But it's not the same thing as reparations. Let me tell you what that's about. You know, I learned in Sunday school a long time ago that if you stole something from somebody, from someone, the right thing to do is to pay it back or in some way admit it and make restitution. The United States of America stole from my people centuries of theft, theft, and it enriched itself. The church colluded, prayed for, blessed, and itself stole from my ancestors. And it enriched itself. The Diocese of Maryland stole from Black people in this state. And it enriched itself. And I know as a religious leader that full reconciliation between persons who have been estranged will never be possible unless and until restitution has been paid to the injured party. It's true in interpersonal relationships, but it's also true in communities. And some may ask, they ask me, well, Bishop, what about forgiveness? I'm all for forgiveness. <laughs> in fact, you know, most Black Americans have forgiven this nation a long time ago. We really have. We're here. We're patriotic. And we're not planting bombs to try to uh, destroy the white population. By the way, they didn't do that in South Africa either. That was the great fear, though, that if you gave rights to 80% of the people, they're going to come back and get us. But that's the, that's the fear that happens from scarred people. So Black Americans, we're here. We've even fought for this nation. I have relatives who spilled blood on foreign soil, soil fighting for this nation when this nation would not fight for them. And they went around the world fighting for democracy and coming home and not getting it. So by the way, don't ever criticize a black person in this nation as being unpatriotic when we criticize and protest America in the ways that we can. You may not like football players taking a knee. And by the way, I'm Anglo-Catholic enough to know that taking a knee is also actually a thing of respect. But by taking a knee, you may not have done it, but before you criticize that, put yourself in their shoes and say, that's a way they can protest in a way that they can. Black people have never stormed the Capitol and tried to stop the processes of government. We're patriotic. We're not saints. Black people do a lot of crazy and bad things. You know, you know that. But, uh, but don't ever say I'm patriotic. Don't ever say that. Descendants are, of slaves are some of the most loyal Americans you will ever find. It's just that we love America enough to criticize it and we want it to live, it, live up to its promises and its ideals. And no, we're not leaving. We're not leaving. We're not going back to whatever racist derogatory names you may give to countries that our black ancestors came from. And y'all know what it is, it, those s-hole countries, another slur, another slur by our former president against nations. Again, it's only nations that are predominantly black or brown. Those are the s-hole countries. But we're not going back. 
unless unless white people go back. You go back first. When you go back to the countries where your ancestors came from, then we'll consider it and leave it to the Native Americans. No, we aim to stick around and make America squirm as much as we possibly can until she lives up to her soaring creeds about freedom and justice for all. So by the way, you're welcome. You're welcome. The word we use to make restitution and to fix the problem is the R word, reparations. Don't let that word scare you. It's a word that kicks up a lot of emotion in people because it's often mischaracterized, it's largely misunderstood. And depending what news sources you have, if you just bring it up, it'll just be an opportunity to maybe talk about how, um, I don't know, people on the left want to take money out of your pockets for things you didn't do. It's a complex subject that involves economic, political, and moral dimensions that are difficult to grasp without a willingness to engage more deeply than having a quick emotional response to it. We found in this diocese that there, there are those who joined our first reparations committee years ago and then the Truth and Reconciliation Commission who knew they were dead set against reparations until they started studying the issue with others and 100% of them saying, ah, I get it. Now I get it. But that issue, that word highlights the racial divide among us, among us. It creates varying levels of resentment and suspicion. It accentuates a pain that has long plagued, plagued our country since its founding. But here we go. Reparations quite simply means to repair. Hence reparations, to repair that which has been broken. Our nation has been broken in this area. It needs to be repaired. It's not just about monetary compensation. An act of reparation is an attempt, an attempt to make whole again, to restore, to offer atonement, to make amends, to reconcile for a wrong or an injury. Everyone living in this great nation of ours has inherited a mess, inherited a mess. You and I have inherited a mess created by the institution of slavery and the psychological and theological underpinnings of it called racism. None of us caused that brokenness. None of us. None of us are at fault for the mess we've inherited. But all of us have a moral responsibility to fix it. All of us have a responsibility. For generations, the bodies of Black people did not belong to them still, themselves, but were bred, used, and sold for the purpose of, of attaining wealth. And that wealth gets handed down from generation to generation. My parents' generation was about the first in some significant number, something to actually be able to hand something down to my brother and I, and I even more, but there we are. So we've profited, did the nation as a whole, institutions and the church has profited from that evil institution. But you know, as we've learned from builders and both moral leaders and builders, a structure with a broken foundation cannot hope to stand. It must be repaired. This is a spiritual as well as a political and psychological wisdom. As we know from our scriptures, from the ancient prophet Isaiah, for example, Isaiah, the 58th chapter, beginning at verse 6, the prophet Here's what's happening. God is speaking to God's people who are fasting, doing religious acts. But God says, I don't want your religious acts. And he says, why do you fast? 
is this is not this the fast that I choose? Verse seven, to loose the bonds of injustice, to undo the thongs of the yoke, to let the oppressed go free and to break every yoke. Is it not to share your bread with the hungry and to bring the homeless poor into your houses when you see the naked to cover them and not to hide yourself from them? If you remove the yoke from among you, the pointing of the finger, the speaking of evil, then the Lord will guide you continually and satisfy your needs in parched places. Your ancient ruins shall be rebuilt. You shall raise up the foundations of many generations. You shall be called the repairer of the breach, the restorer of streets to live in. My brothers and sisters, the Diocese of Maryland wants to repair. We're going to repair this breach. We're going to do our part. And we're going to restore some of the streets that have been made uninhabitable from centuries of oppression. How do we repair the breach that we find ourselves in? Let me just say a few things about what we can see better what reparations means by describing what it is not. So first, reparations is not throwing money at the problem of racism. I find that image offensive. When people talk about throwing money at something or someone, it's almost always referring to the poor and especially to black and brown people. It's like throwing paper towels at them. It's like you just throw, you know, and I hear that a lot, throw money, you know, you're throwing money at problem. But you know, you never hear a rich school district is throwing money away at its students. Those, their schools are well-funded. They have buildings that work adequate school supplies and programs. But when the conversation comes to having those same resources available to poor black and brown students, then we hear, well, you know, we can't throw money at those problems. Meanwhile, the roofs are leaking, the bathrooms don't work, and teachers employed who can barely read. No, reparations instead is an emotionally healthy effort to repair a broken system that results in broken lives. Some of that effort involves money, but it's not all about money. Reparations is more than money, but it's not less than money. I find that generally when you start talking about money, that's when people are saying, well, now you're messy. Because, but we know why people don't want to start talking about the money, because it gets at some very, um, um, very hurtful and bad things. But secondly, of what reparations is not, reparations is not a transfer of money from white people to black. Rather, it is what this generation does to repair the damage that previous generations have caused. It's the commitment of an entire community. I'd like for our entire country to do it. But it's the commitment of a community to repair and heal the mess that we've all inherited. And that means all of us, this generation, your black bishop of Maryland is going to pay reparations because I've inherited a mess caused by ancestors. And it doesn't make any difference if your people came on the Mayflower, your ancestors owned slaves or plantations or not, or were slaves, or if you're a recent immigrate, an immigrant, no matter what ship you came over in or what fence you may have climbed over, you're all in this mess. We're all in this mess. And it's going to take all of us, white, black, rich, poor, Republican, Democrat, Episcopalians, and oh my gosh, Methodists and others, <laughs> to repair the mess. In some ways, 
because um, the, I've had hard working. My my grandfather, my father, my father was an auto mechanic. He scrounged, he, he wasn't afforded a high school education in rural North Carolina. And he worked hard to put me through college and others. Worked hard and got little from it. One of the smartest guys I know, but I knew the opportunities he didn't have. And so, um, uh, in some ways, I, I, I'm never a victim. I'm not, I'm not a victim of anything. But, um, but it is ironic that the sons and daughters of slavery are also responsible for maybe coughing up money to repair the damage. It's all of us. Third of what reparations is not. Reparations is not writing a check to individual black people, persons. For one thing, that would be unworkable. We know that. President Obama knew that. And all that. For one thing, you have to, you have to, you have to, uh, exp you have to actually explain what a who is a black person. And then you get into the issues of race. Um, what does it mean to be black? What does it mean to be white? And uh, thanks to that program on PBS by Henry Louis Gates. <laughs> have, have any of you seen the program? What's the name of the program? Type it in somebody if you, <laughs> I, I forgot right off the bat. I, I used to watch those things and it seems like uh, every week, some person, uh, a, a black person uh, finds out, uh, you're finding your roots. A black person finds out they're not as black as they thought they were. And a white person finds out you're not as white as you thought you were. <laughs> you know, we all are really inherited from, by mito mitochondrial DNA from that earth mother from Africa. Uh, um, in that sense, in a sense, we're all Africans. That's what most anthropologists and scientists believe. Um, that's where it all began. And so, you know, so if you're, if you're, one parent was white and one parent was black and it was individual checks, what do you get, half a check? <laughs> or after the, it's unworkable. And race is a, a social construct anyway. And further, to do so, to give individual checks to persons would not really undo the damage caused by 350 plus years of slavery and economic oppression. The charge I gave to our reparations task force is fund initiatives that will make an impact on communities. And giving every black American a check for say a thousand dollars is not gonna impact broken systems. Reparations rather is a sustained and serious effort to strategically fund initiatives that are geared to counteract systems that leave millions of black residents entrapped in communities of poverty, crime, and despair. And as I've already said, individual responsibility is very much needed to lift yourself up, uh, lift, lift yourself up. But the fact that there are millions of our brothers and sisters in these communities is not an accident and it is not their fault. You tell them it's your, your fault. I had a priest in my office just yesterday, a wonderful man, a white priest, who's been trying to help um, this young African-American male, 20 something year old. And it's just so hard. This guy, the 26 year old wants to do so well. His father was a, a, who had gone to prison. His mother was a drug addict. And he's, he kept saying, I'm not gonna be like my father. I'm not gonna be like my father. And guess what? He's facing jail time. He's making the same mistakes. He doesn't want to, but we know the power of the system and the power of the streets. Well, um, the system is constantly working against, um, against residents in these communities on so many fronts, and only a few of them facing superhuman odds are able to get out and almost always because people with means have helped them to escape the odds. So what would some of those efforts look like? 
in the diocese, we're focusing on these five areas. I should have written these down, I can't remember. Education, affordable housing, adequate health care, economic, uh, I'm sorry, environmental degradation, especially in black and poor communities. And fifth, um, some microeconomic initiatives, maybe job creation initiatives. Those are the five areas. And we're gonna be funding things in those five areas. Well, let me wrap this up. The Diocese of Maryland, when we took that vote in May to affirm reparations, um, I think for a number of the deputies of the delegates, they voted to affirm the pastoral letter I wrote uh, and, and, and with a committee, we had a group of us working on it. Um, and it was about a 20 page uh, letter. You can find it online. Uh, and uh, I think they were thinking, they were voting to affirm that letter, but the letter said, we gotta do reparations. So when you vote to affirm it, Anyway, that was 100%. We had not a single nay vote of clerical and lay leaders against that. Some of that was by design because I kn we knew that if we started talking about money right off the bat, it would never get off the ground because money makes people crazy. Um, so, when, uh, But when we took the vote again last year to vote on the money, which again was overwhelmingly approved, 80 some, 86%, it would have been more if people, if we at the time been able to identify where the resources were coming from, but the timing was such, we still had to have the diocesan council make some decisions. But those are monies that are coming from endowment that are um, that accumulating over years and even centuries and some and other monies. It's not monies taken from our annual budget but we wanted to come to an amount. Why $1 million? It's not a mathematical computation, but it's a moral computation. A million dollars is a way of saying, we're gonna do something that's actually going to hurt our bottom line some, because that means less money to get from endowment. And it also represents about 20% of our annual budget but also an amount that um, can make some impact. If we announce as a diocese uh, with a $5 million, million dollar budget that for our collusion with 350 years of uh, slavery and oppression, we commit $50,000, that would be an insult. Since that time, what has been the um, reaction? I get notes and cards and letters especially for non-Episcopalians. People around the state of Maryland and beyond who write me and say, thank you. Thank you that the Diocese of Maryland is taking responsibility and putting its money where its mouth is. And they're sending me checks. I've got, I've got several checks from poorer, small, white, working class churches than anyone else. Another one last week, several of them, who are just saying, we get this, we get this. I got one check from a woman, not an Episcopalian, but she read about what she was doing and, she's, and she told a story about how through some DNA research, I don't think she was on Finding Our Roots, but she found out she had some black relatives. She never knew that as a white woman, uh, some distant cousins who were also in Maryland and it just so happens they did not do uh, economically well, but she did. Again, it's not an accident. And she said, thank you that a church is recognizing that a lot of this is systemic. I hope the enclosed check can help you. It was a check for $100,000. And she says, you put that money to use in the impoverished black community. 
the, the reaction within the diocese, it's a little more mixed. Outside of the diocese, they seem to love it. <laughs> uh, not everywhere. Um, and, and some of you may know when I was on Fox News, I got pretty much savaged on that and misquoted and all that, uh, that but I'm not going to get into that. Um, so I'll leave you with this and then I'll entertain questions. If the Diocese of Maryland, as diverse as we are, well, we are a 90% white diocese. It may even be a bit more. We are rural, suburban, small town, big city, suburb, uh, everything in between, farmers, crabbers, and yachts people. We are rich and poor, Appalachian, and some captains of industry. We are Republican and Democrat, conservative and liberal. If the Diocese of Maryland can vote to do this thing, why can't America? Why can't others? I'm a Christian. That means I hold to the scriptures of the Old and New Testaments it's my, and the teachings of Jesus. And the Bible mandates that leaders are to be held accountable for the fair and equal treatment for every inhabitant in the land. All of us have been taught to love everyone regardless of their race and human condition. However, we must come to acknowledge that there can be no love without justice. And there cannot be justice without some form of repairing an injustice. We are now at that point for this long overdue work. Thank you all. Thank you, Bishop Sutton. Um, we do have some questions for you. Uh, first question is, are there any ways that individuals can help in the diocesan reparation efforts and initiatives? Yes. Um, a couple of ways. One is individuals, you actually can write. And if you want to uh, send a, a check or some money, you can say, um, uh, you can write me or, or well, it's simplest to just uh, address it to me and say, I want this to go to the reparations effort. One of the things we did do in the resolution is to encourage, not require, but encourage every, uh, every congregation to consider making a contribution. The one million dollars is a seed fund, but um, we want to spend it all. We're not talking about an endowment where you just take the interest and fifty thousand dollars a year you give it to somebody. We want to spend it because we, and so we're going to run out of money on that unless people give in some way. So uh, individuals can, but also congregations can say, "Well, do I want to be a part of this or not?" Some congregations are doing some other things and they're having their own efforts. That's okay too. Uh, and that's perfectly fine. But I would encourage if St. John's is thinking about such a thing um, to also just support the diocesan efforts as well, because together, all of us together, all 110 congregations and parishes together can make more impact than individual congregations in a way, you almost do both. But um, I mentioned one, the Sutton Scholars Program, and it, an individual congregation can't do that. It takes a diocese, a household of faith. And so there will be other efforts, too, that we want to get the diocese behind. I hope I answered that, but if not, uh, come back in another way. Thank you, Bishop Sutton. Um, the next question that we have, um, is the Episcopal Church as a whole starting to work towards ownership of this issue? And where have you seen this played out in the national church's efforts? Thank you, great question. Um, absolutely, the Episcopal Church is, is probably the leader in this nation on that issue. And then followed closely, I would say, by Roman Catholic institutions. Uh, when we voted on this in May of 2019, it was very shortly, around the same time that the Diocese of, Diocese of New York, also having done research into its complicity in slavery and injustice, they also voted for a fund and to do some things. It's impacted us more than them. They've been doing work over the years too. But, um, uh, but Diocese of New York, and then um, 
uh, after that, since that time, the Diocese of um, Texas, our richest diocese in the um, uh, Episcopal Church, they voted a multi-million dollar fund to go to some things. But you know, there's oil money there, or as they say in Texas, oil. <laughs> um, and, um, but also theirs was not a diocesan process like ours because they and the Diocese of Georgia and another diocese, their bishop or bishop and council just says, here's what we're gonna do, but they never took it up to a vote for everybody like we did. I wanted everybody to get involved because it also educates people. So the Diocese of Georgia, Texas, Long Island, New York um, have followed us. And now the Diocese of Fort Worth, I spoke down in Fort Worth, Texas. And I thought, my gosh, get me out of there right afterwards. They're gonna run me out of town. They, after that talk last year, they, they began a Truth and Reconciliation Commission and a commission to study what they can do in terms of reparation. Roman Catholics, there are Roman Catholic institutions. Uh, you know, the Jesuits have committed uh, some monies and some other schools, Georgetown University. By the way, Virginia Theological Seminary, our Episcopal Seminary, committed $3 million. Um, again, uh, they have hundreds of millions of dollars, by the way, in their endowment. We have 20. Um, and uh, and some, some other institutions, but not a Roman Catholic diocese that we know that we know of, nor another, nor of another grouping of churches and others. Now they're interested. The National Council of Churches also had me speak um, uh, to their gathering on that. And I think more are gonna uh, follow, but the Episcopal Church is definitely taking the lead here. And that's as it should be. And you know why, it was the Anglican churches that came here first in 1619 and all up and down the Eastern seaboard. We brought a particular brand of slavery with us and um, we're some of the oldest of the churches here in, this con uh, in North America. So we, we bear more of a responsibility, responsibility than even the Presbyterians, or, or the Methodists who are more anti who are more abolitionist, abolitionist than we were. I think you're gonna find some more Roman Catholic dioceses too, because uh, they were here early too, and they know what it's about. Thank you, Bishop. Um, we have another question. Uh, besides church groups, um, do you know of any other uh, institutions that are uh, getting involved in this work of reparations? Um, and do you feel that uh, it's really more the work of the church or should it uh, be local, state and federal government initiatives as well? Another great question. I'm gonna say three, three quick things about it. Yes, we just read, we just heard this past week that the city of Evanston, Illinois has committed a fund to reparations. It's a growing movement. Um, so yes, in terms of the church, um, again, leader, I'm gonna say the church, the Christian church should get out in front of this and we should take the lead. Other institutions in society should, should follow the moral courage of the church. And I think if all the churches say, we're gonna do something here, then I think you're gonna see it in other bodies as well. I'm not worried about bankrupting America on, um, for rep from reparations. When I testified in Congress, I think it was at that testimony, I wrote it down. I even gave a suggested figure for the United States of America. Here's what's happening. That, that bill that I testified for uh, with ta Coates and Danny Glover and all the others, that bill called for the establishment of a blue ribbon bipartisan commission to study the issue and make recommendations. It wasn't even an amount of money, it was to study it. So, but it, it doesn't get much traction because- I find this pretty. What, why do you think that many in Congress don't want the issue studied? I just leave it at that. Because I, I think they know what our experience has been in Maryland. 
if you study it, you'll find out that something's old <laughs> and you're scared to even face that. But anyway, uh, so at the testimony, I gave a figure and I said, okay, you'll never be able to repay the, um, uh, the descendants of, of slaves in America, not what it's worth. You know, bankrupt America, nobody wants to bankrupt. And I also talked about a figure. I said, the Pentagon in 2019, the Pentagon had estimated that we have spent, what, was it $7 trillion or was it $10 trillion estimated for our wars in Afghanistan and Iraq and Middle East since 2003? It was either seven or $10 trillion, and I just don't have those figures in front of me, that this nation has spent on that. By the way, what's the return on that investment? Um, and so I gave a figure, uh, and it's shared by some others, $500 billion, $500 billion. Knowing that um, uh, in the, a few years ago, Congress uh, and the president approved a tax cut that everybody knew was going to um, uh, result in a trillion dollars deficit as we go down. And I just said, you know, that's a half a year's deficit, 500 billion. But what would $500 billion do if say a Baltimore share of that was, I don't know, a billion, a, a billion or 500 million, what could Baltimore do for the uplift for $500 million? So I said 500 billion. And um, it seemed like, right these days, it seems like a smaller figure than it was last year. <laughs> because Congress is voting a trillion here and a trillion there for, for everything. But, um, but I think you'll get a lot more return on 500 billion than you will for, uh, would for some of these other schemes. But here's the other thing, it does. It's a sign to all of us and to the world that the United States of America takes this seriously. Um, and I'm, I'm going to answer one other a question that you haven't asked yet, but I'm going to do it right now. Is reparations new? It's not new in this country. Mm -hmm. Some for, reparations to, uh, for uh, at least some discussion about what are we going to do with the freed slaves happened beginning 20 years before the Civil War, when people were even wondering, one U.S. Senator, I think from Missouri, said, what do we, we've got to come up with something. You can't just release them to nothing. And then the proposal in the Civil War, at the end of it, a proposal to Abraham Lincoln was for 40 acres and a mule. 40 acres. And he was considering that. Can you imagine what that would have done if each of those freed slaves families were given land, land, and a means for independence to grow things? But uh, when John Wilkes Booth fired on the president, shot him dead, another act of terrorism, domestic terrorism. When he uh, shot him, and by the way, his grave is at the Green Mount Cemetery in Baltimore here. I've been to it. You ought to go to it. John Wilkes Booth Jr. And you will see fresh flowers on that most of the time. Yes, in the Green Mount Cemetery in, in Baltimore. Um, when he shot him down, he also shot that proposal down because uh, the vice president was Andrew Johnson, who's generally considered to be one of the worst presidents in the U.S. He was the first to be impeached. And he, um, but he did away with it. He was a Southern sympathizer. And so that got off the table. Um, there were reparations that were given out though, in terms of some, in fact, many plantation owners were paid money for the losses they incurred during the Civil War. They received money but not the slaves. This country has been behind reparations in some measure for some communities ever since. Um, the most prominent being for Japanese Americans in 1980, uh, I think it was 82, Ronald Reagan was president. And for the uh, few years that they were interred 
in camps during World War II, Japanese American families were given a sum of money. Notice that there was no public outcry. No one, there's no big thing. We can't do reparations, can't do reference. It's just when it comes to black people, then you can't do it. That can has been kicked down the road. That can is still on the road and we're not gonna kick it down for the next generation. Other nations as well, Germany, it's estimated that Germany has given to Jewish organizations about 90 some billion dollars as a form of reparation for what they did with, against their Jewish population. There've been other uh, things around the world too. The Anglican churches have done this in other areas. Canada has paid some reparations to, uh, to Native Americans. The US, not. Thank you, Bishop. Um, we have another question here. Um, are individual parishes in Maryland diocese making commitments on their own, such as Emmanuel in Baltimore? Yes, and Memorial in Baltimore too, as well. And I, and, and as I alluded to before, yes, they are. It's just my encouragement to also give to the diocesan effort. Um, and we'll make sure that, um, that parishes are acknowledged in a big way that are doing so. That's one of the things that the truth and that the um, reparations task force is charged with. The reparations task force what has been formed. The vote was taken in November. So uh, a couple of months ago, uh, we formed the task force. They've started meeting. The co-chairs of our diocesan task force are Nancy Hennessy. She is the rector of Sherwood Parish in, um, in um, Cockeysville, Maryland. And then there's an African-American layman. Um, uh, uh, oh, I'm sorry, getting out. I, his name will come to me in a minute. I only talk to him every other week. <laughs> Uh, he's a member of St. James Lafayette Square. Uh, they are co-chairing co it. And that 12 member group is, are white and black and, and young. We have youth representatives, older ones, uh, Appalachian, uh, suburban. Again, it takes all of us. And that group will make recommendations for what to fund to the diocesan council who will approve uh, along with the bishop, the bishop and the council will approve the expenditures. So, um, yes, yeah, some it, we're still early in the game, though. Right now, only about five churches have responded uh, so far, but it's early. It's early. Bishop, are there any resources at our diocese that churches can use to uh, take a look into their own history? of slavery, uh, and, and if the churches were built during a certain time, are there any, any church records or, or is there any way that we could get assistance from our diocese to uh, take a look at what our own history may be? Absolutely. For one thing, it will take an individual or a group of individuals in a church to really get behind it and be responsible for the research. We have an archives in uh, our diocesan center that's the envy, literally the envy of the state of Maryland. They'd love to have some of our archives. And they, uh, our archivist gets, uh, whom we pay, uh, gets inquiries all the time from governmental officials and, and others and historians all around researching history of Maryland because the Anglican church took good records and we still do. That's why it's very important <laughs> when the bishop comes around and, it's, and, the, and the parishes get out the books for me to sign. The attendance record, yes, but the record of marriages, confirmations, baptisms, and deaths, those are actually official legal documents. So um, we can help you research that. We have lots of that. And so inquiries to, um, um, uh, to our, our archivist, um, uh, Ms. Klein, we have two Kleins and it must be late in the day. I don't know why my mind's escaping me, but um, uh, you, you, she'll help you. But also contact Chris McLeod, Christine McLeod. She's our candidate for mission. She will direct you also to people. The TRC, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, has the information 
of what a number of churches have done to research their own histories. But be assured of this, your church may or may not have been built at least in part by slaves and many of our churches were almost all of them before 1840, uh, but uh, you, you can pretty much count on it. But even if your church hasn't, it won't take very long to see how your church may have benefited from redlining, segregation, and all the attendant institutions that flowed from slavery and racism. That pretty much leaves everybody. We've all been enriched in some way. Well, thank you, Bishop. I don't see um, any other questions in our, our chat right now, um, but we are so grateful that you spent this uh, time with us this evening. I know that your time is very valuable and uh, we are most grateful that you, you joined us this evening and we will uh, continue uh, at St. John's and in the Ellicott City community to um, reach out to one another and continue these important conversations. So we're really grateful that you were with us here this evening. Um, Bishop, would you mind closing us in prayer? Uh, no, I will. And thank you again so much for having this. These are hard conversations again, um, and they're not easily faced. But if you don't face them, you're in trouble. Mm -hmm. it's, it's kind of like being, um, if you're uh, diagnosed with a very serious disease and um, the person in the white coat is sit sitting across the desk from you saying, this is pretty serious, it's pretty bad, we're going to have to have surgery and it's gonna hurt. But nobody is gonna say, nope, can't do it, I don't wanna hurt. <laughs> when we know in medicine and in all things of healing, even psychological healing, it involves some pain and some amount of hurt in order to be healed. So, um, so if there are hurtful things heard and said in this process, that's part of the healing process. But we'll all get there. I know that. And I know that about St. John. So thank you all. Thank you. Let us pray. Oh, Lord, our God, we pray your blessing upon us that we may never sell ourselves short, thinking that we cannot. And may you bless us with courage to risk, to risk something big for something good. And you, may you bless us with the wisdom that the world is now too dangerous for anything but truth and too small for anything but love. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among us and remain with us forever. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much for joining us tonight. And thank you to all of our viewers and who have joined in this series. We are grateful and we look forward to continuing conversation. Good night, friends. <laughs>